Senior Helpers is proud to present The Senior Gems, your guide to supporting family members with dementia, featuring Tipa Snow. Hi, I'm Tipa Snow. I'm a dementia care specialist. My background, I'm an occupational therapist with over 30 years of practice experience working with older adults in almost every possible setting. What I've done recently is partner with Senior Helpers, and what we're doing in this DVD is working with you, the family member, when you suspect or you know that the person you care for and love is experiencing some form or type of dementia. The goal of this DVD is to provide you with knowledge and skills so you can do a better job of helping the person you care for, but also helping yourself. It's a long journey, and both of you are on it. What we want to do is make sure both of you have a good experience. Although there are some changes associated with aging, disease is not a natural part of aging. If you are noticing changes in memory, mood, and activity level of your loved one, it's critical that you share these concerns with a physician. So what kind of medical support should you seek? In most cases, initially at least, you're going to want to see a specialist, someone who knows a fair amount about aging, dementia, so you make sure you get a good evaluation and workup. Everybody deserves that. You may want to actually seek out somebody who specializes in working with the elderly or working with different cognitive impairments. Or you at least want to make sure that what you're getting is a full evaluation and not just a quick office visit with an assumption that what you're seeing is a dementia because it might not be. And this is your chance to speak up and stand up for the person you're trying to help. It will pay off in the long run if you know what you're looking at and that you've had it looked at carefully. You don't want to make a mistake at this point and have it be a pseudo-dementia. For example, delirium, depression, thyroid problem, and you let it go, even a hearing problem. You want to make sure that what you're dealing with is the real deal, because if it is, it's going to change everything, and you want to know that. Understanding the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia can be confusing. Learning the difference will help you be better prepared for speaking with physicians and understanding your loved one's disease. So one of the big questions most family members have is what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? And here's the basic idea. Dementia is a great big group of diseases. It's not all one type. It's actually considered a syndrome, not a diagnosis. And under that big umbrella term, we have different types of dementia. And Alzheimer's is a particular type of dementia. It's one we've known about for a long time, and so we know a fair amount about it. Let me give you another example to maybe help you with this. If I were to say to you, I'm going to give you a piece of fruit, you have in your mind sort of the general category of what you're going to get. But it's not until I say, you get a banana, you get an orange, you get an apple, that you know exactly what's going to end up being in your hand. And so dementia is the great big category. Alzheimer's is one specific type, as is vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontal temporal dementia. This is a whole little group. And so those are types of apples up underneath there. It's complicated. As a family member, you want to start to understand this a little bit better because you're going to end up being an advocate. You're going to need to seek out and find the right kind of medical support for the person you're trying to help. And you want to make sure that you're getting best quality evaluation and treatment. You're going to be their advocate, their spokesperson. You need to know what you're working with so you can do a better job. Many times we think of dementia as a memory problem, but it's much more than that. The brain is actually going through physical changes and all parts of the brain are affected. Knowing the ways the brain is affected will help you understand why your loved one's behavior has changed and the best ways you can provide care. So as a family member, you need to understand how your brain works a little bit. What's where and what does it do and what doesn't it do when someone has dementia? So I'm going to give you the most common scenarios. And we're going to start on a brain tour. Let's start with the front. The front of your brain is the part of your brain that says, behave yourself. 
It's your executive control center. It's the part of you that lets you be the person you want to be and to see it from another person's point of view, to make good choices and decisions, to start, to stop, to multitask. With dementia, this is an area of the brain that frequently is hit and hit hard. They still want your respect, but they're not good at decision making. They're not good at seeing it from your point of view. They don't understand why they can't do and they say whatever comes to mind because on the inside of your brain up there is the part of your brain deep inside the brain impulses. The impulse to do what you want, say what you want, the impulse to drink, to eat, to behave yourself in a bad way. We all have those impulses. What we do is we control them with the front of our brain. But when dementia happens, things slip through. It's not intentional, it's just the way it is. The second part of your brain I want to focus on, temporal lobes. Now the temporal lobes is where your language control centers are, but both sides are not the same. And Alzheimer's particularly, and many of the frontal temporal dementias, attack the left side more than the right. And the left side, for a large portion of the population, 98% or better, is where you have formal language skills. Definitions of words, comprehension of speech, the ability to physically produce speech, and your ability to find the words you're looking for, to say what you think, what you remember, what you want. This side is the side that gets hit. Over here on the right, preserved. These are things that they tend to keep better. Number one, automatic social chit chat. Number two, anything with rhythm and music, including singing, even late in the disease, but prayer and games that involve rhythm. And they understand the rhythm of a question when they don't understand the content. And finally, forbidden words, swear words, sex talk, racial slur, ugly words, unfortunately preserved and when this isn't available and this isn't working, you hear things you would never have heard from this person. It shocks you. It's not them, it's the disease. Now let's go deep inside. And this is the one that everybody sort of knows about. Take your fingers, put them to your temples. And if you were to shove in three quarters of an inch, you'd hit exactly where learning and memory takes place in your brain, the hippocampal area, one on either side. It's very vulnerable. And for many dementias, it's the first indication of a problem. But it's not all memory. At first, what you'll notice, they can't hold on to new stuff, new details. What they can learn is new emotional memory, whether they like you or not, but they don't remember why. And then you start to notice problems with recent stuff. But the old stuff is fine. And of course, they're talking about it a lot because that's what they're most comfortable with. New stuff gone. And then you start to notice their time traveling. They're getting lost in their life. They're actually thinking they're in another place in time and they have those momentary lapses and then it becomes a pattern. And then they get lost in tasks and then they get lost in a moment. And it's not on purpose, it's this part of the brain dying. Now let's look at another part, back in the back. Let's skip to that because this is a real critical part and for most dementias, it's affected early on as well. It's where vision is stored. And you don't lose your ability to see, but there are some very common changes. One of the first things is you have trouble with peripheral awareness. Your brain can't handle all the incoming data, and so it makes a decision. We have central vision, which gives you the detail, the specifics, gets you to be able to do things, and peripheral, which makes you aware of incoming. So what your brain says, the middle's more important. Start to ignore the edges. And their awareness of the world around them gets smaller and smaller. But there are other things that take place as well. Our ability to hook up what we see with what we know and remember. So how do I know that a cup is a cup? How do I know what's in a cup? And how do I know that if I'm thirsty, what I should look for is a cup? That hooks my visual center to my language center, to my frontal lobe. And when these systems are failing, what we find is I look at a cup and I dump it on the floor even though I'm very thirsty and I don't realize what I've just done. As a caregiver, you get very frustrated if you don't understand what's happening is a change in the visual field. And what that means is I pick up a comb and try to brush my teeth. I might pick up a razor and try to comb my hair. You as a caregiver need to be aware these changes are happening and I'm not doing this on purpose either. This is brain failure. Now the final part of the brain I wanna spend a little time on is a part that we rarely talk about with dementia which is sensation, and then in the front of it, 
movement. You feel things happening all over your body and it comes up through your spine and lands on the surface of your brain. So you know what's going on from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head. You didn't realize that, you just thought it was happening. No, it has to be taken in and processed so you can do something about it. This strip, the one in front, is what controls all the muscles. You control every muscle in your body from your brain. So that connection between sensation and movement, sensation and movement, you feel a sensation, you do a movement. As this disease progresses, that wiring, that connection between what you feel and what you do about it is destroyed. And so I can sit and develop a pressure sore. I can try to get up and not realize I need to have my feet down. I don't know, not because I'm not trying, but because my brain is dying. And finally, be aware with this increasing changes in the sensory strip. There are some parts of my body that I may actually be much more sensitive in and other parts where I have hardly any awareness at all. This will be the four areas where you see a lot of sensory awareness, lips, tongue, and mouth, palms, and the hands, and the fingertips, soles of the feet, and genitalia. So how many care tasks take place in those areas? Huge numbers. And if as a caregiver you don't understand, I may not be aware of the scrape on my arm, but when you try to help me brush my teeth, oh! What you're getting is a hypersensitive sensory response. The better you understand this, the more you can help effectively by visual, verbal touch. Cues matter and the sequence matters. We'll talk about that later. There are several traditional scales used to describe the progression of Alzheimer's and dementia. Tipa Snow has taken the Allen Cognitive Disability Model, which focuses on what those with dementia are able to do and replaced the numbered scale with GEMS. By using GEMS, Tipa not only reminds us of how precious our loved ones are, but also makes it easier to understand the progression of this disease. We've talked a lot about what is dementia, but this is a disease that spans anywhere from five to 18 years or longer. There's a lot that can happen and a lot of changes that are gonna take place. Brain failure doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. So what we wanna do is create a system, a way of looking at it that looks at not only what are they losing, but what are they still able to do? What are their interests gonna be? And most importantly, how can we help and what's the environmental support they're gonna need for success? It means you're gonna have ways to help that are specifically geared to what are they now able to do? And it's also gonna provide you with opportunities to go, oh, well, this isn't working anymore. They've changed levels of function. And the way we go about this is to try to see people as precious and unique, as special, not as just losing stuff, because it's more than just losing, it's changing. But for everything they lose, there are things they keep. So what we're gonna talk about are gems. Gems, because gems are precious and unique. They need the right setting, they need the right care to shine. And here we go, let's start off. Sapphire, diamond, emerald, amber, ruby, and pearl. Now, sapphire, that's true blue. And that means your brain isn't changing. Now, it's aging, but it's not changing in a abnormal or weird way. What that means is the person is pretty much how they've been. They're true blue, but I will also tell you they're slower than they used to be. It takes longer for them to reach decisions. They're more likely to go, wait a minute, don't be pushing me. They have moments, as we all do, it takes longer to learn new habits, it takes longer to learn new information. They need more visual cues, more props. When you say, don't you remember? Well, yes, I remember. I might be a little feisty, but I do remember with the right calendar, with the right visual information. Make sure your verbal isn't overwhelming to me. Do a good job, that'll help. Now let's talk about the first signs that something's not normal. Diamond. Now think about it, a diamond, clear and sharp. They're still looking clear, but something's going on. They're very rigid. They can't be flexible. They can only do what they've always done before. They're very big on habits and routines and they don't want anybody messing with their habit and routine. They can't stand it when something's out of whack. 
I will also tell you that they will talk a lot about older stuff and have a really difficult time hanging on to new specific information. However, they will be able to know whether they like you or not, and they can cut you. Diamonds are sharp and clear, but they also have lots of facets. It means everybody sees them differently. So you're spending a tremendous amount of time arguing among yourselves as to whether or not there is something going on or not. More than likely, there is. Now, diamonds don't remember, and they don't like it when you point that out, or they'll say, well, I don't know what's going on here. We don't want to make them feel worse. What we want to do is use what they're good at, habits and routines. Try not to change as, as much as you cannot change something. Use what they're familiar with, and then what you want to do is give them the right support for what they're having trouble with. Be prepared for those old stories. Listen to them. It's a good idea to find out what those old stories are. Actually write them down because you're going to need those later on. Learn the art of I'm sorry. It's one of the most important phrases you're going to have in your diamond support care. Also, I'm sorry you're right. Even if they aren't, let it go. You're not going to win a battle. You want to practice skills that are going to use visual, verbal, and touch cueing and get rid of the words, don't you remember? because the fact of the matter is, they don't. Now let's talk about emeralds. Emerald is when you see that green color, whoa, things are changing. No denying we've got dementia on board now. And the color of the gem, green. Green is for go in a stoplight sequence, and these people are on the go. They're going back in time, and they're getting very vague. They're having trouble with some things about that. You're finding the, um, to put all the, you know what I'm, Word finding, problems with comprehension, they actually think they're in another place in time, at first only momentarily, but often this is where we see a huge amount in the late afternoon, early evening of looking for people who have died, talking to people who are not around, wanting to go to work, got to get home. They are home, but they don't think so. They are also having trouble with their personal care routines. They're doing things, but they're making mistakes. They're skipping steps. You notice it, they don't. The truth about emeralds, the flaws inside, they don't know that. They're putting the same dirty clothes back on. They haven't had a shower. They think they've had a shower. They don't know where they are in the day. They're skipping meals. They're double eating. That's an emerald. What do we need to do? Structure the day. Fill the time. We need to figure out how to give visual cues that sound friendly. Don't be a boss. Don't turn into their mother. They're not going to like it, and they're not going to do well with it. What we need to do is be friendly, use humor. Use visual cues, tremendous amount of visual cues. If you want them to do something, do it alongside. Give them a prompt, give them a cue, but don't argue, don't fight, and don't remind. Go with their flow. If they're back in time, you've got to figure out how to be okay with that, not try to correct it. Really tough, really tough. Limit verbal interaction. Don't say too much, don't say too long, don't say too many different things, and watch your touch. Keep it friendly. Don't try to do for people. This is where doing with is critical. The next stage of the disease, we talk about ambers. An amber of all gems is the softest. It's the one that's not a mineral. It's not in the ground. It's actually rosin comes out of a tree, and then something gets stuck on it, more rosin flows over, and it hardens up a little. But of all the gems, it's the most changeable. It's in the moment. This is something caught in a moment of time. This person is actually in a moment only. And in this stage of the disease, it's all about what does it feel like? What does it look like? What can I do with it? It's all about sensation and exploration. Now, when you have an amber, whoa, it just can drive you over the top because it's what do they want? What do they need? But it's in a moment. So they're doing something and it doesn't make sense. They can take a room apart. They can, they can mess with something in a way that you would never have thought. Safety is a huge problem for Ambers because they have no safety awareness. If they want to reach for something, they'll step on top of a chair, on top of a stool, on top of a, they will reach down into a toilet to find water to mess with. It's not on purpose. It's all about sensation. What do I like? What don't I like? Be aware, most care activities involve sensation on parts of the body where they're hypersensitive and they don't necessarily like it. Sensory tolerance is going down, and yet sensory need might be high. So you might hear me going, no, 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 no. And that sounds like you could take it for a while. 24-7 wears you out. Amber is tough, especially when you're feeling stressed. The next gem level to focus in on, ruby. Now, rubies are red, 
And in a stoplight sequence, the stoplight is stop. It can't happen anymore. And what stops is fine motor control. Fine motor in the eyes, fine motor in the mouth, fine motor in the fingers, and fine motor in the feet. So what we start noticing is they still have big movements. They can still copy us in big movements. They can sing. They can dance. But they're having great difficulty figuring out how to use utensils, how to use tools, how to engage with a tabletop activity. What they're spending a lot of time doing is either sleeping or walking or rolling if they don't have walking anymore. Great risk for falls. We tend to want them to do things, and they are doing things, but they can't do it the way they've always done it before. It's big movements or it's resting. Wake sleep cycle, not good. What stops? Eight hours of sleep and 16 up. What that means is they're on a schedule. It may not match your schedule at all. They may nap, they may get up. It's exhausting as a caregiver. Recognize caring for rubies, ooh, hard work, because you're having to do a lot of physical assisting now but they have to accept that assistance or you end up with a big struggle. And this is a person who's a full-size person, not a child. And finally, the last gem we want to talk about is a pearl. And I selected the pearl because it's hidden inside an oyster shell. And this is where if you focus on what's on the outside, the body, what's left, it's really ugly. At this point in the disease, the sensory strip and the motor strip are dying. And when the motor strip dies, it leaves all the muscles turned on. And so the person curls up, their muscles tighten up, they develop contractures. They're not eating well, they're not drinking well. And when they do drink, they often have trouble with swallowing because that's controlled by your brain as well. What we want to recognize is inside that shell is this amazing gem but they're trapped inside the shell. They're not gonna be out there very often. And it's the pearl. And the pearl is formed layer upon layer upon layer. And as a caregiver at the end of this journey, you're gonna to need to modify how you provide touch, how you provide warmth, how you provide comfort. And know that in moments, the shell may open and the person may very well still be there. And you have these amazing moments of connection. But ultimately, you will lose the person. So you need to be ready and prepared to let them go. And that means we offer and we support and we do care, but we can't change the outcome. So what we have here, sapphire, diamond, emerald, amber, ruby, and pearl. Recognizing a person can go from one gem level to another in a day, in a morning, in a moment because this disease varies. Our job as care partners recognize the indications of what gem level they're at in that moment, provide the right environmental support and the right care right then, and then reassess. You can't bank on what was to fix what is right now. You do want to have a heads up though if you're seeing these kind of changes. Is it something you really need to check out because, hmm, this is new. Is it a change in gem level or is it an illness or a, a condition where we do need somebody to take a look and see if this is something we need to work on, make sure that it is dementia and not something else like a urinary tract infection, an upper respiratory infection, a disease process besides the one we're working. Are they in pain? Unmet needs can result in some gem level changes. What we want to do is pick that up and deal with it. So gems matter, progression matters. As a family member, recognize what's happening. Is it the disease process or is it something else? Are the caregivers you have who are helping doing the right things for the gem that the person is? And if so, everyone is gonna be happier and we're gonna have better outcomes. Environmental changes, care changes, both will be required to give the best quality care for the gem that you have in that moment. There are skills and techniques that will help both you as the care provider and your loved one have less distressing and more meaningful days. Here TIPA will provide an overview of ways to use cues, start and complete tasks, communicate effectively, create a positive environment, and deal with the occurrence of delusions and hallucinations. 
When you're working with people with dementia, there's five different ways you can give cues. We're really gonna focus on three, visual cues, verbal cues, touch cues. In other words, what you show them, what you tell them, and how you touch them or physically assist them. Make sure you always start with good visual cues. Add verbal, make sure those verbal cues match up with the physical cues, and then and only then do you add touch and you get the just right combination. If you start with touch, it doesn't work well because the person doesn't understand frequently what it is you're trying to get them to do. Visual, verbal, touch. The other two can come in handy, what they smell and what they taste, particularly as you're trying to build interest in a meal or you're trying to get them to want to go outside. But as a rule, these are not the two you use most frequently. These are your key skills for helping. Visual, verbal, and only then, touch. Another skill we want to focus on is how do you get the person going? How do you get them to do something you want them to do? Well, you've used your cueing idea, visual, verbal, touch, but now what we want to do is one of five ways to help people get going. Number one, you give them short, simple information. Remember, not too much. Keep it tight, keep it focused. Then what you want to do is offer simple choices, this or this. Not what do you want to do, but would you rather do this or would you rather do this? Would you rather drink this or would you rather drink that? Third option, ask them to give you some help. Could you help me rather than me help you? Really good way to get them engaged because you're giving them a job, a task, something they feel valued about. Then fourth we have, ask them to give it a try. Rather than you need to go to the bathroom, come on mom, could we try? Give it a try. And finally, if they're not getting what you ask, maybe if you ask for something too big, they can't figure it all out. They can't find the first step. How do I get started? So break it down. So if you're asking them to get out of a chair, say, pull your feet under you. There you go, now lean forward. In other words, think it through. What happens first, what happens next? So five different ways you wanna think about what works for the person you're caring for and how much cueing, visual verbal touch, can you give that might make a difference. What we wanna focus on now is how do you start an interaction with a conversation? And what we wanna talk about is supportive communication. There are several things to keep in mind when you're trying to get started. Don't get set on your agenda. Greet before you start to try to treat or to address issues that you're worried about. So start with something like, it's Tipa. In other words, say your name. Don't focus on the relationship. This is especially important as the person is moving forward and they may not recognize their relationship to you. It's not important about the past. It's right now. Can they like you right now? So give your name. Don't say, who am I, Mom? Who is it? Do you know who I am? Don't go there. It's not helpful. It's distressing. It makes them less functional, not more. The second thing to think about doing that might be something that might be helpful is to say, well, hey, rather than, oh my Lord, Mom, that's the same outfit you had on yesterday. Focus on a positive social greeting. Why? Because we know the right-hand side of their brain works better than the left and we wanna get off on the right foot. Third option that you can use, and I encourage you to, make a positive comment something about their clothes, their looks. Ooh, good color. Oh, aren't you handsome? Do not say, look at you. You've got stuff all down the front. How am I gonna take you out? You're wet. Not what's wrong, what's right. And you may have to work on this. You've gotta make your eyes go to their face, not to the part you noticed. But the more you get into the habit of doing this, the better you will go forward with that person. And finally, one other thing to think about, bring a visual cue, bring a prop, bring something to drink, something to eat, a flower, their favorite object, something to visually connect you and give you that ah moment so they like you before you start getting into what it is you need to get them to do. We've spent a significant amount of time talking about how do you give care, but the other piece of this puzzle is the setting the environment, the home situation, or the care situation at least. 
What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? And what can they taste when they're in that environment? And it matters. So as the disease progresses, you're going to have to look at the physical environment as well as the care environment to know what's the best setting for this person at this point in time. And at first, when you have a diamond, you do want to keep things pretty much as much the same as possible as long as it's working. But then what we have to realize is when they become an emerald, we need to change the environment. Maybe we need fewer visual cues about going out the door. Maybe we need more auditory cues that says, come here, listen to this, this is going to be nice. More smell cues to encourage me to come have something to eat. And then in amber, we want the right environment for safety. Caution is a huge issue here. They need things they're going to be able to do things with, but it's got to be safe. Things that we don't want them messing with have got to be secured, out of sight, out of hearing, out of touch. Then when we have rubies, we need walking pathways. We've got to have things where people can move around, move around safely, and then have some rest. And if they like being around people, the old in bedroom situation may not work at all because they don't want to be alone, so they keep coming back out. If that's the case, we need some environmental changing to match the gem level. And then finally, when they're a pearl, we're going to need to provide the right environment. We may need to change the immediate environment for the individual, but the big house doesn't matter anymore. One of the very commonly distressing behaviors that you might see when somebody's in the middle stages of dementia or even early on is that they have hallucinations or delusional thinking. Now there's a difference. Hallucinations are seeing or hearing something that's not there. Delusion are fixed beliefs about something. So let me give you an example of the difference. Hallucinations, I see my mother and so I'm talking to my mother right there, or I see a little boy up on a, on a ledge. That's a hallucination. A delusion is, I think you stole my pocketbook. I saw you walk off with it. But what's happened is I've actually hidden my pocketbook because I'm afraid someone is gonna steal it. So those are two very common kinds of things that happen. Not to everybody, but it can happen. The first question you want to ask, is this a brand new behavior? And if it is, we should get it checked out for the possibility that they have a physical illness. This is not a symptom of dementia. So it could be dementia, but it might also be that they have a urinary tract infection, an upper respiratory infection, their medications aren't right. So don't assume dementia. In the moment while they're having the hallucination or the delusion, what we're going to do is connect and then go with their flow. We're not going to try to fix them. We're not going to use reality. We're not going to try to get them to understand they're wrong, we're right. So an example might be, oh, okay, well tell you what, it sounds like that little boy is bothering you. Tell you what, why don't we go in the other room and I'll see what I can do to take care of him. I didn't say I saw him. I didn't say that I didn't see him. What I said is, sounds like it's bothering you. In other words, I'm connecting to the emotion they're telling me about. They're worried about that little boy out there. I'm going to try to meet that need of dealing with the little boy, but I also want to get him in a new environment because maybe it's something in the environment that's triggering that behavior. If it's a delusion, I think someone has stolen something. I don't want to argue. It's not going to work. What I want to do is approach the person using a positive physical approach. Hey, ma'am, you're really angry. It sounds like this pocketbook thing. You don't, it's not where you always keep it. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And you don't like that girl coming in. I know. I know. Now, let me give you a heads up on this. As soon as you pick up on they're suspicious of somebody, let that person get out of visual range. The longer you let the person with dementia look at the individual they think caused the problem, the more solidly set the delusion becomes. Remove that individual and have somebody else step up to the plate for a little bit. Somebody the individual traditionally or may in that moment at least trust. So we have this conversation. Yeah, I know. I don't blame you. I don't like having my pocketbook messed with either. Tell you what, how about I look around, see if I can't figure out, maybe somebody just put it up to keep it safe. If they say, no, 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 I think she stole it, I know, you're not liking her and you want to get up with the police, I hear what you're saying. Don't deny their feeling and don't deny their right to want to do something. But notice I also didn't say I was going to. I just acknowledged how they're feeling. Acknowledge it. And then, tell you what, let me take a look around. I'd hate to make a mistake. If the police come and we find this pocketbook, maybe it is. Let me just take a look. What you can do is see if you can't find it. Now, if you truly can't find it, then you may end up having to 
make a phone call, quote unquote. Yes, okay, well, I'll talk to her about that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I hear what you're saying. So I should gather some information about it? Okay. In other words, it's still going with the flow, but you may actually have to create opportunities to let that happen. Now, on the person they thought took the pocketbook the next day, try to have them wear something, act different, look different, because those visual cues can really come in handy. So maybe if they keep their hair down, today they wear it back. Maybe they bring the person something, their favorite thing to drink. Be aware, emotional memories can get formed. So what we don't want to do is create stress and distress. We want to try to meet that need. As a caregiver, you will need support. You will be making changes. What we want to make sure is that you feel that level of support. You have the right knowledge, you have the right skills. Because although this is hard, it is possible. It's not for everybody to do hands-on care, but you're still gonna need to be involved as an advocate, as a support person for someone else who's caring for the individual. Get smart, because it may very well be happening. The goal of this presentation has been to give you a greater understanding of Alzheimer's and dementia and inspiration to make changes that are best for your loved ones. We hope that what you have learned in this video is as meaningful for you as our commitment to caring for seniors is to us. To learn more about Senior Helpers and the GEMS program, please visit our website at seniorhelpers.com.